nothing different, just the person changes. Yeah. And then you get a million views. People think you're funny. People think you're creative. And then these people will go on other platforms. Like TV will hit up them. Like, oh, maybe they're all, they're really funny. They go, they're not a bomb. bomb. Yeah. Because they found out, oh shit, I have to rest on my own laurels. I didn't develop any of my own content, my own thoughts. All I did was scroll every day and look for something to steal. <laughs> That's in five, four, three, two, one. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Genius Brain Podcast. I am your host, David So, and we have Ed Park right here today. Funny enough, we were just talking about, uh, you know, before we started rolling, like the, the perception. And I've, and I've talked to, about this a lot on the podcast, but I feel like sometimes when I say things on this podcast, people think that I'm saying things from a very hateful place, right? <laughs> right? Which understandably so, your boys are haters. It's, yeah. it's literally half of my comedy is me just hating on shit and, you know, picking out things that most people wouldn't find funny. And yeah. I just hate on things because it's just a fun thing to do, right? Mm -hmm. But when I talk about things in social media, I think I do have somewhat of an idea of how this works, right? And I, I'm always um, wary for young people who get into this, who wants to do this as a job, because I, I, I have friends who are elementary school teachers. And a lot of these kids, when they write what they want to be when they grow up, they say a, a, an influencer, Yikes. which is crazy, right? Yikes. And I'll say it again, like I've said it a million times on this podcast, if anybody out there who wants to do what I do, not so much I do, but what you know influencers do, Go ahead. I say you do it and try it, but I'll tell you it is going to be one of the most difficult things that you'll ever do in your life. And the reason why is because a lot of these influencers that you follow, they work jobs too. Mm. You know, mm. it's not that easy to make money on this yeah. unless you have like a certain business mind state or you know how to leverage yourself. Right. So, I mean, you were talking about that, that, that kid on TikTok, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I saw this video. It is just kind of sad. It is. It's just straight up sad. Like, um, it was a TikTok repost. You know how that shit goes. Like it's on Reddit or Instagram because I'm not on TikTok. Yeah. But it was like, you know, that voiceover. When you have two point some million followers mm -hmm. and do a meet and greet at VidCon, right? And it's pointing at her. She's a pretty girl. And then she flips the camera and she has nobody in her line yeah. to come meet her. I was like, holy shit. How do you have two million followers? And then at VidCon, the, the, it's like the, Comic Con of of like YouTube, mm -hmm. Instagram, TikTok, all that for influencers, and nobody knows who you are. And nobody's there to actually see you. That blows my mind. Like I, that's the part that I don't understand about it's this day so and age. It's so weird because short form content and the way that TikTok is developed. And I had a conversation with somebody, and I told you about this, um, where I literally got into an argument with somebody who was trying to tell me how social media works. Right? Yeah. And this is somebody who has tried to be in the entertainment space since I've met this guy and been giving him advice because I really believe that, you know, he's, he's a funny, funny guy and he could do a lot of great things. Problem with him is that he is so stuck in his ways. Mm -hmm. He doesn't understand how social media works. So for example, <laughs> we got into this, you know, argument, which he shouldn't have been an argument. And the reason why it became that way was because he was talking out of his fucking ass right. and I didn't want him to invest his time into stupid shit. So for example, he was like, oh, I have a friend who has like 70,000 TikTok followers. Like this guy's made it. You know how Yikes. sad that is to hear? Yeah. <laughs> that shit is sad. Was, I mean, that's a lot of people at a football game. Yeah. <laughs> and then I was, I was trying to explain to him. I was like, listen, I don't know what you mean by made it. And they're like, oh, because like, you know, the guy's famous now. And I'm like, no. That's yeah. not how it works. I was like specifically on the TikTok platform and I was breaking it down to him. And your example of that is what I'm talking about. TikTok is a very different social media app where people don't really become invested into the individual. They just watch and they scroll and they move on. Watch, scroll, move on. Watch, scroll, move on. Right. Which, isn't pro which isn't really problematic. It's just, just how the platform is developed. Right. It's different. And so he was using me as an example. He goes, well, you have like a million you know, followers on YouTube, blah, 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 blah. And like you made it, but your views don't reflect that. I was like, 100% true. Yeah. But I'll let you know the difference. People who have watched me on this channel have been with me since they were fucking 12. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Oh, right. And they haven't left. Right. Like I walk out till this day and we make that joke with me and Tim. We're like, I'm famous too. No, like I get recognized too. We just keep, continue the joke. Yeah. So it's, 
we've grown up with these people. We've created content where we've created an actual connection because this was long format content. It wasn't some quick joke that you got to move on from. Occasionally, people might recognize you from TikTok here and there, but there's a different type of connection that you have. A lot of companies, too, don't put money into people who only have TikToks because they know their conversion rate is terrible. Mm. They can't sell a product because people don't care about your fucking opinions. Right. They just want to see you make your fucking video and fuck off. Do you find it very odd that a lot of these people who are TikTok famous, they still live at their parents' house? Mm. Mm. Think about that. Your favorite TikTokers who you think are balling out of their fucking mind. And by the way, I'm not shitting on people who aren't making big money on TikTok. I'm trying to let people understand that you have to be passionate about this stuff and develop the business after that. Yeah. Right? So you, the passion comes, then you develop something to make money. Money's not going to just fall in your fucking lap. Yeah. Right? A lot of the most successful people on this platform who I've seen have developed a business platform with their stuff. I personally haven't even done that. Right. Minus, you know, Junbi, right? Those people are making big banks. And so they kind of look at these top TikTokers and they go, well, they made a lot of money. That's You're, you're talking about the 0.0001%. Mm. Who's, who's going to say that's going to be you? So I'm having co this conversation with this guy. And he's trying to school me on this thing I've done now for 13 years. Yeah. <laughs> and the guy has been trying for 13 years and hasn't gone anywhere. And it's like, how do you have the audacity to tell me how the fuck this shit works? Right? right. And so we got into this little thing where he was like, okay, he goes, well, most people who watch TikToks are, you know, ages like 30 and above. And I'm like, what? Where do so, you get that from? So he started Googling this shit. Right. And he was like, see, like people are like 26 to 45. There's a, like, there's a certain percentage. He goes like, I was like, okay, I've had conversations with people at TikTok. Right. And because I got my account banned twice. <laughs> right. And I, I asked him the same question. And I just me trying to explain to him the difference between age gap of people who are on TikTok versus engagement. And I'm right. like, yeah, there are definitely older people who are on TikTok, but they're not the most engaged and they're not the ones with the buying power. Mm. It's usually the youth. He goes, that's not what it said on Google. They said that the age is 20. I was like, listen, you're talking about who downloads the app. I'm talking about, and he goes, nope, you're wrong. You just don't like it when you're wrong. He was trying to sun you it's on sun me. It's like, <laughs> but then at the end of the day, the proof is in the pudding. Mm. What have you done and what have I done? So at this point, I, I gave up. I'm like, okay, you know what? Since you would rather just sound like you're right instead of just taking this thing that, yeah, I'm substantially younger than you, but I have garnered a you know, decent amount of success on this, then stay where you're at, Yeah. right? Don't ask me for advice anymore. Don't ask me for any fucking handouts. Don't do this fake little thing where you're talking about you appreciate all the hard work I do. I don't want to hear any of this shit anymore. From here on out, you stay in your fucking lane and then you go ahead and you complain about your life. Right. And I got tired of people like that. I got really tired of people complaining to me about their situation and doing fucking nothing about it. And that's basically what that was. It sounds like those delusional people who think they're going to make it to the NBA. Yeah. <laughs> it's like when you play basketball and that one guy just starts yelling at everybody on the court. It's like, you're not going to go to the NBA. Dude. Yeah. Like relax. Relax. It's cool. Mm. Yeah. Social media is a fucking trip, man. And I, I think for anybody who wants to try it and get into it, do it. But, you know, Gartner, like really level your expectations correctly. Like know what you're doing and know what you want out of this. If you want just recognition for people to watch your videos, you can do that and then not make any money. Well, it was like a, a few years ago, a while ago, like um, I had a friend who worked with like inner city youth and they had this like, um, like a career seminar. Mm -hmm. And so they had like restaurateurs, like chefs, people who work in this industry or that. And then she wanted me to come and talk about, you know, uh, video production or entertainment industry. And then, you know, everybody had a chance to talk and speak about these things, like what they do in the restaurant business, what they do. And I don't know, as a mechanic, this and that. And then for me, because, you know, I, I came from the YouTube background at that time and I was telling them what, I, you know, you talk about what I've done, where I've been, whatever engagement from all these kids. Right. And I felt I don't know how to say this. I felt like a few stabbing eyeballs yeah. from the other guys because of what they do. But then the engagement from the kids, when I ta started talking about video production and YouTube, everyone would like want to know what, what it is to do what I do. Yeah. Because we were saying, like you were saying, like so many kids these days just want to grow up and be an influencer. Yeah. Right. But it, and even that title two of influencer. What the fuck is that? Yeah. What does it mean? Like influence you to what? What? Right. Buy shit or do stupid shit. Prank motherfuckers on the street with some dumbass shit. The pranks are kicked. coming back. I don't understand. Uh, I've seen them. They're like, 
they're, they keep popping up with these fucking white people who are fucking up with like, like, like black Americans or Latino Americans on the just street, like trying to start fuck fights. Yeah. yeah. That's ridiculous. And then people still eat this shit up and they go, I'm a content creator. I guess I'm an influencer. I fucking guess. Yes. But then if you do that shit, what are you going to sell? What kind of ads are you going to make? Yeah. You know? Pepper what, spray. <laughs> well, that's what I'm talking about. So it's the idea of what what does it take to be a celebrity now? Like a celebrity is just anybody who gets used. Well, like I said, this is that's fine, mm-hmm. right? But there are certain people who expect a level, certain level of respect. Like this this girl who has two million TikTok followers. Nobody shows up to her meet and greet, and she's like, "Why aren't people showing up?" Because you're not creating shit. Mm. You're just creating shit that everybody else is creating. They're just there for the good time real quick. They don't give a fuck about you. They're not invested into your life. They don't give a fuck about anything that you do. That's the weirdest thing. Like I used to think that um, people never really cared about what I did yeah. until I got to meet people in person. And then even something small, I did a Genius Brain show, right? 300 people showed up. I was like, oh shit, I can't believe 300 people showed up to the show. Yeah, You know, b- like literally blew my mind. Like I know it's not a thousand person stadium, yeah. but- 300 people is a lot. Yeah. You know? And I sat there thinking like, holy shit, these people actually came here to see me talk. Some people flew from Florida all, all over the place. A lot of people came from like out of state. Yeah. And, you know, thinking about that and how I've garnered this relationship with this very small group, it's pretty fucking amazing, right? Mm. And the idea behind that really kind of stems from me just continuing doing what I'm doing. And then the YouTube stuff was longer, longer form content. Right. Like I grew up with these kids, right? Like they listen to these videos for advice and that kind of shit blew me away. And that's really the only reason why I'm still doing this. Mm. There's not, there's really, when you, when you look at like the level of achievement that you can do on YouTube, once you hit a certain point, it's all the same. Right. A million views, 2 million views, 3 million views. At that point, you're just doing it for a paycheck. So now it's like, what's the purpose of me doing this? It's to make people laugh, to give some people this, this moment to be stress-free, to, to all offer alternative thought and just to kind of live my life and see if people can take something away from this, whether they hate me or like me or not. And I think a lot of these young uh, social media content creators don't have that. It's just, how can you get people to see me? How do they, Mm. how how are people going to recognize me? Do they know me? It doesn't matter what it's for. There's no care in terms of curating yourself. I'm not talking about like fame or whatever. I'm talking about you as an individual. You're not creating things for yourself and you're not developing yourself as a person. Right. So, like because I'm not on TikTok, um, I, I, what I've noticed though a lot of TikTok is just reposting and just it's copying reposting. the same skit or the same audio bite. Is that what it is? So that's the genius thing about TikTok. TikTok is a platform that blew up, and I and I talked about this with a few other people too. The reason why TikTok did so fucking well, it allowed non-creative people to fake being creative. <laughs> Let's not name names, but yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. Like I know, you know what you're talking mean. about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it allowed non-creative people yeah. to fake being creative. Yeah, it's an already set idea and trend that you just have to hash, click the hashtag, find it, cop, do the exact same thing, nothing different, just the person changes. Yeah, and then you get a million views. People think you're funny. People think you're creative, and then these people will go on other platforms. Like TV will hit up them. Like, oh, maybe they're all, they're really funny. They go, they're not a bomb. bomb. Yeah. Because they found out, oh shit, I have to rest on my own laurels. I didn't develop any of my own content, my own thoughts. All I did was scroll every day and look for something to steal. <laughs> <laughs> that's all they did. And yeah. that's the thing too. TikTok also allowed non-creative people to steal openly and yeah. to make it okay. It is normalized to steal content now. And it's okay. It's 100% okay. Yeah, I can't stand that shit. I mean, there was that time like when, um, you know, like content stealing was just like the wild west across platforms. Like you, you put on a uh, a skit on on YouTube, and then some fucking Malaysian Facebook page would take your shit, cut off your credits, and then get like five million views across Facebook. And yep, shit. and Facebook didn't give a fuck like where it came from. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there had to be like a change where they had to stop that shit. I'm glad that they did, but that annoyed the fuck out of me because there was that iPhone five <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> video yeah, yeah. we made, and then like like a few days later on Facebook, some fucking page stealing Everybody it. Everybody bit that shit, dude. Yeah, like legit. Everybody bit that shit. 
I remember after we did that video, there was like the the, the, the other iPhone came out. They literally bit the fucking video we did <laughs> just for the next iPhone. And it was, there was like seven or eight of them. I'm like, yeah. holy shit. There's no integrity. Right. I get like, I, like times have changed. I, who cares? Whatever. Uh, it right? feels like maybe like that lightning in a bottle. It only comes to the very few. Mm. Right. Like, because of that thing. I was at work, you texted me like, did you see the keynote speech? Yeah. It's like, yeah, let's let's film. Like you already wrote out a script. I came right after work, we filmed it. And I was like, all right, good night. But then I was like, now nah, let's let's like put it together. And then we just ended up editing it yeah. till like seven in the morning. <laughs> and then I had to go right back to work. Next thing I knew, front page of Reddit, yeah. 2 million views in that first day. Right? It was so- Does that shit even happen anymore? Yeah, it, it doesn't. Like what does viral mean anymore, right? Did somebody, I think it was uh, Melvin Gregg, um, very famous. Uh, I mean, he's a great actor now, um, started off on Vine. And Melvin Gregg had this interview. It was this really quick snippet that I saw. And he was like, social media is a trip. You can put your heart and soul into something and think that it's the greatest thing and it won't pop off. You'll do a video. It'll be 2 million views. You don't post for three days. They forget you the next. Right. right. They'll literally throw you away as if you never existed after three days because somebody else will either take your idea or you won't put enough content out and then you'll just disappear off the face of the earth and people won't recognize you at all. There's no there's no investment into creating. Mm. You know, that's why I think we love film so much. Mm. A lot, there's a lot of things I dislike about Hollywood, right? Especially when it comes to auditioning, filming, mm. all this other stuff. And I know a lot of people who get roles just because they know people. Right. right. Not because they're great actors, not because they killed the fucking audition. It was just, oh, I know you. Let me put you in this. Right. And that's all that it takes. Right. There's there's crazy nepotism in Hollywood too. A shit ton. Yeah. The other side of that though is when you create something and it lasts forever. The impact that it creates. People watch these pieces over and over and over again. Yeah. Nobody digests great content like that once and then they just leave it alone. That's true. So like Instagram and TikTok doesn't really allow you to go back and search and find your favorite video again, right? Yeah. You'd have to be, have the presence of mind to save it the and moment you see it. it, right? Exactly. Yeah. You know, and I think like with me, I don't know how many times I've saw uh, Old Boy. I don't know how many times I've seen all these other film projects, right. you know, and it's because they created legacy with it. It's something that you can go back and enjoy it even more than you did the first time. And mm -hmm. that's fucking amazing. Right. I think a lot of people maybe aren't creating with the mind of making something that has rewatchability. Yeah. yeah that you yeah. could sit there like, because I mean, it is short, much shorter content, obviously on social media, but then if you can make something that has rewatchability where you can just watch it loop, that's the shit that really works these yeah. days too. Right. And it's also like skewing some, I think for young people, skewing your perception of what you should develop. Right. Mm. Doing social media is a skill. You've developed that well, but now you want to do stand up. Now you want to do movies. Now you want to do acting and film. Guess what? Step your fucking game up. It's a different, different thing. Do you think there's like college classes on how to be an influencer? I'm pretty sure they're starting there's some shit be. like that. If so many kids this this generation want to be influencer. There's got to be a like a like a path. Like so, there was way. a class I took even when I was in college. It was uh, it was a sociology and new media, mm. and that's how I learned about YouTube. Mm. So sociology and new media. That's yeah. It's just like a whole new sociology era. It, it yeah. didn't exist before. It's like the observations that people are making about this is it's actually quite fascinating. Mm. Like, I mean, just to even think about it like this, what was the measurement of somebody who was cool in high school? Yeah. Your popularity, right? Yeah. Like uh, the sports you play, um, student leadership that type of shit right your talent or your fucking class clown or some shit or you're the badass kid or now it's shit. what's your tiktok number <laughs> how many followers do you have yeah the idea of becoming cool is so fucking different there's things that require certain levels like practice and skills they don't really matter anymore mm. it, it they don't care about that they want to know how many tiktok followers you have mm. because there's this idea that you're a person of greatness if you have people who follow you but then again, once again, to wrap it back to the girl who has 2 million followers and nobody showed up, what does this show? What does it actually show? It kind of shows like the ugly side of what, what social media is. Yeah. You think that these people care about you, right? In, in a short form content sense, it's going to be hard. It's, it's like rejection without anyone having done anything. I know. 
<laughs> nothing happened, but that's precisely the problem, right? Yeah. Wow. I mean, that's that's a fucking wild place to live in. I can I can't even imagine how what that would feel like. But it, the reason why she posted it because she posted it as like a sad comedic vibe, which I commend her for. Yeah, it was awesome. Yeah, but, but at the same time, the reality when you're not on your phone and you're in the real world, like at VidCon, like. Dude, man, I'll, I'll tell you this too. There was somebody who uh, who I know that let me know something. So when I did that show out in uh, out in Long Beach, I kind of lightweight fucked up because I thought the House of Blues in uh, not Long Beach in Anaheim, House of Blues Anaheim was the same size as the other one out on the west side, yeah. which is like a two hundred seater, two hundred ish, three hundred seater. It's right. not the one in Anaheim. The fucking concert hall. Damn, <laughs> I didn't fucking know. You thought it was just like a cool, chill, small little mm -hmm. space. And that's what yeah. I wanted. And so when I showed up, I was like, uh, what the fuck? I only sold like 300 tickets. Right. But they could fill out like a thousand. And so it was like, fuck, man. But I heard like somebody else who does a podcast was like, they were talking shit about it because they heard that I didn't fill out the venue. I was like, did you know how big the venue was? Yeah. It was like for like 1,200 people or a thousand people. Yeah. Well, I don't know. But people could look it up, but it's way more than 300. Right. Yeah. And I didn't fucking know that. It's not like I could have filled it out either way. And I was like, why is this person talking shit? I'm like, that's kind of mean. <laughs> right? So I heard that they did a show, uh, 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 like their podcast show, right? Yeah. Fucking like, damn near nobody showed up. It's like, it hurts a little bit, huh? Yeah. You're talking a lot of shit. What, like, what does that do for you? Like, that didn't make me feel good that nobody showed up to theirs. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But it's like the fact that you would sit here and laugh at me about that. It's like 300 people is a lot. Like, yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot of fucking life. people. In my it's, mind, I thought, especially locally. Yeah, right, for you, like, but then at the same time, you saying like people fucking flew in. Yeah, that's, so that's I was crazy. like, damn, dude. And it's not like mine was at like any uh, special. It was like you. The only reason why you would come out to the show is just to see me and then Bose. Yeah, and so we, you know, we had like three hundred people in the seats. That was pretty fucking good. You're gonna do another one, another live show. Yeah, so I'm I'm working on something right now where I want <sighs> I want to do like a genius brain stand up tour. Okay. Right. So, um, with like 200 seat venues. <laughs> yeah. 200. We're not, we're, uh, there's no way a thousand people will show up. We, yeah. I might even be lucky if a hundred people show up. Yeah. You know, especially if I do it in different cities. Yeah. But, but still, even as, as a stand up set, though, 100 people is solid. Yeah, dude. And yeah. 100 people feels really, really and who fucking are there good. just to see you. Yeah. yeah. It feels really, really fucking good. And, um, uh, I think next year after I get the whole business thing up, I'm, I'm definitely going to go into, um, doing stand up, maybe not full time, but really, really work on these jokes. So I saw your story the other day. You did stand up. But let me tell you this shit, right? So, I mean, I'm gonna talk about it on the other podcast, but we'll talk about it here today yeah. too. I wasn't supposed to do stand up that day. Okay. So long story short, my buddy, uh, Jason Chenney, he's the guy that blew up on Instagram, mm -hmm. right? I bought him on the podcast. I've been trying to give him a lot of shine, got him on JK News. This guy, me and my buddy Pat, Pat's also a stand-up comic. So we were going to go to this venue out in Long Beach. And I was like, hey, I want to see you perform. He goes, cool, come through. Mm -hmm. So I was like, cool, me and Pat will roll through. I was like, Pat, you going up tonight? He goes, yeah, I'm going to work on some jokes. He goes, cool. I was like, you going to do some stand-up? I was like, nah, bro, I'm going to fucking go in there and watch you guys. Yeah. Cool. And then we get a text from Jason. And I see this little video with my face <laughs> on the fucking TV screen in front of the comedy club. What? And he goes, hey, so you're performing tonight. He booked you? He booked me. What I the fuck? was pissed. <laughs> I was pissed. Bro, I started sweating bullets. Damn. I was sweating my fucking ass off. Because you know, I have crazy anxiety. Yeah. I haven't done stand-up in a club in like four years. Very long time. On top of that, no material. I haven't written material. Mm. I like I write jokes here and there, but I put it in the catalog so I could do it later. I haven't written material. I get there. I see Jason. I fucking Muay Thai clinch this full. I knee him in the gut. Right? <laughs> and so he's laughing. His, and I'm laughing too because this is by far one of the best pranks ever. Yeah. Because <laughs> like I'm pissed, but I can't stop laughing because of how good of a prank this is. Yeah. Right? I was like, bro. And he was like, well, you have to go up, pussy. <laughs> <laughs> so if you don't go up. So this is the thing too. Like all these thoughts are running through my head and mm. I'm like, I, I meet the club owner. His name is John. Super fucking cool. He goes, bro, you don't have to go up. Like, don't worry about it. Yeah. Here's the problem with me. I have a lot of anxiety, but I also have this thing where a million thoughts are racing through my head. And I'm thinking to myself, like, listen, just do it. Yeah. Like just fucking do it. 
And so like the big side of me is like anxiety. And the other side of me is like, you, are, you ain't no pussy. Yeah. <laughs> so this side started battling each other out. And this whole time I'm sitting there, it's like, I have no material. But if I go up on stage, I might freeze up. And it, and it put me back in a place where I was 17 years old again. And I was doing stand up for the first time. Mm. I felt just like that. And it was trippy. I felt like I walked into a time machine and I could look at myself when I was 17 year old doing 17 year old David doing stand up for the very first time. And it felt just like that. Did you feel like you needed it though? You know what the weird thing is? Like after I processed that whole situation, I, I thought to myself, it, it, it put things into, um, it gave me a lot of clarity, yeah. right? And what I mean by that is that it made me think to myself, number one, it actually does bother me when people, when I read a comment that says like, oh, you have an opinion about other comics, but you don't do stand up." And it didn't really bother me like in the sense, like I'm not losing sleep over it. Mm -hmm. But in my mind, I'm like, they might be right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I was like, holy shit, they actually might be kind of right. Like I haven't done stand up in years. Yeah. So am I just like talking out of my ass? Yeah. And so a part of me, well, that was a part of the big motivation why I said, fuck it. I don't have anything, but if I've been doing this since I was 16 years old, I should be able to do something. Yeah. Like David, are you funny? Can you make these people in this room who have no idea who you are, right? Are you objectively funny? Yeah. Can you fucking do it? And that shit was battling inside me that day. Yeah. And I, it kind of faced, I had to face something that I didn't have to face before, which is without your following, these people who know you, they know that you're funny. So you still have to make them laugh, mm. but they understand who you are. There's a lot of inside stuff that you can work on. These people don't know who you are. Can you prove your worth again? Just like when you were 17 years old, can you do it? Yeah. So I grab a beer, I drink it, it calms my nerves. John comes up to me and he goes, you don't have to do this. And I was like, John, whatever, let's just do it. Fuck it, let's go. Yeah. And then Jason hears me. Jason runs up to John. He goes, David's going to go up. He goes, how many minutes do you want? I was like, he's like, two minutes? I'll give you two minutes and I'll just, you can, I'll give you a light and you can go off stage. John was super nice. And I was like, we're just going to see what happens. So I ended up doing 10 minutes, right? And I got good laughs. Like people were laughing and it was a pretty, I think it was a pretty hard room because it was yeah. only like 30 or 40 people in there. Right. And I was like, okay, I don't know what these jokes are. And guess what I opened up with? Making fun of Shang-Chi. <laughs> <laughs> it worked, right? <laughs> Dog, and they were cracking up. Because like, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm damn sure it probably worked well because I mean, from what the rest of the world has, has seen was just how awesome it is or whatever. Yeah. But then if you got an Asian guy to say some shit about some Asian shit, then it's a new perspective that like, that people might needed to hear, you know? Yeah, people were fucking laughing and it was weird. Like it was a weird, odd satisfaction because at first I didn't realize people were laughing because I was so nervous. All mm. I could hear was white noise. Right. And so I just went back to, and Jason gave me really good advice. He goes, look, this room is not for you. This is not a huge room. Mm. You don't have to make people laugh here. You're just going to work on material. And I was like, Jason, I don't have fucking material, <laughs> right? He goes, say whatever, talk about your day. It doesn't matter. Just go up there and just do your shit. And he kept, you know, he was, it's weird because Jason's really goofy, but he was very serious. He goes, talk about anything. He goes, mm -hmm. you're a funny guy. I know you are, right? Yeah. And he's like, just go up there and just do your shit. He goes, you've done stand up for years. Just fucking do it. He goes, just talk about anything. And so I was like, you know what? Let me just talk my shit. And then I just went up there. I don't even remember the rest of the jokes I said, yeah. but people were cracking up and I'm like, oh shit, I can still do this. Mm. It's like something I've, I've I'm in, at 16, mm -hmm. but I'm like 34 now. Yeah. That's a lot of time. That's 18 years yeah. of stuff that you've tried so hard when you were younger. It doesn't go away. And I was kind of shocked that I could still be comfortable on stage as if I've done it for years. Right. And and you have, did you have moments where you're just like, you're fucking thrown wet, crazy dry. And you're <laughs> I mean, like the crazy detaching. thing was, I think the beer caught my nerves down. Mm. So I was just up there just talking my shit. And right. I, I saw what I felt in my head wasn't what I looked like on stage. Because I saw, they sent me a couple of clips and I looked really comfortable. But I, to me, I felt like I, I wanted to die. Yeah. Like I, I wanted to fucking die. I got off stage and I thought to myself, that was fucking terrible. That set was fucking trash. And then, you know, Jason and Pat came up to me like, bro, you were fucking cracking up the room. I was like, I couldn't hear any laughs. He goes, no, they were laughing. Mm. And I think they were shocked too. Because it's like, dog, you went up there, no material. And you pulled that shit out of your ass. It's like, 
that's pretty brave. Hmm. Well, do you see yourself, you know, uh, doing it again? I don't know because like, I think I do want to do a tour once just because it's on my bucket list, but I have no inclination to want to be the best comic in the world. Right. That was the driving force that I had before where I wanted to be an undeniably amazing comic that when I walked into a room, other comics will recognize me and they go, that guy is fucking funny. I don't have that anymore. Mm. Um, I mean, you don't need to because you have your own audience. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so now I just enjoy just connecting with people like on this podcast. It feels fucking different, but having to be faced with that fear. And you know what? It was true because Chris Sosa, my buddy who's also a stand-up comic, said some shit and I didn't really think about this. He goes, are you afraid of going up on stage? And now that you have a following and people know who you are, that somebody's going to walk off stage and say, David Sosa is actually not that funny. And I was like, I wasn't before. <laughs> <laughs> now that you say it. <laughs> yeah, I sure as fuck am now. Yeah. You know? And I had that thought before I was going to go on stage. I was like, what do these people know me? And they're like, oh shit. David Sosa's not funny. He just talks a lot of shit. Mm. And I never had that doubt in my head before. And I, I was faced with that doubt right before I was about to go on stage. Did you prove yourself wrong? I mean, yeah, I did. Yeah. Which felt, I felt vindicated. Nice. You know, nobody knows who I am in this room. And I have mm. to prove my fucking worth to these people. Yeah. So they don't know who the fuck I am. They've never seen me anywhere. They just go, oh, this guy's funny. Dude, I'm fucking proud of you, man. That shit was <laughs> like, scary, I, bro. I can't do that shit. I just got reminded. I mean, you know, and I know that like my worst fucking best man speech in the fucking world. Yeah. So I don't know if you want to keep this in, but I, um, I fucking saw Kev and he was at the that wedding. Kev who? Jumba. Oh, really? How's he doing? He looks great. He looks fine. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and then he was like, oh shit, I haven't seen you since that wedding. Oh my <laughs> God. It was like, that speech was so bad, man. I was like, yeah, I know. That's so fucking funny, yeah, dude. The worst of it is like, yeah, I mean, at the, when, when, when people say comics bomb and shit, it's like, I don't know what that feels like, but I know what bombing a best man speech is That's essentially like. the same thing, bro. Yeah. So you know exactly what it feels yeah. like. So like, I mean, I don't know if I'm ever going to have my fucking time, you know, to ever give like a better best man speech, but at least I know what it's like to bomb. Oh, it, it sticks with you for the rest yeah. of your life. But at the same time, like, because I've been able to make fun of myself over it as well. So much better, I've, isn't it? It's so much better. I can talk about it and I can openly, that's how like, I think that's Kevin like and the, I like started to talk again and like opening up with that shit and just whatever. Yeah, I think up. that's like the biggest change about you when after you started going to therapy and everything else is that you have been able to really be very introspective and be able to laugh at your flaws. Because mm -hmm. before you had a lot of trouble with that, like things would hurt you a little more. And I think because you were so in your head about these things, like, you know, as a group, when friends, we were just laughing at each other, you know? And I think sometimes you took it really personally because you were battling shit here, yeah. you know? yeah. And so when you couldn't make fun of yourself, it just made it worse for you. Mm -hmm. And then when you're in front of goofy people, we just laugh even more, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which doesn't help. You know? yeah. <laughs> so. No, for sure. Over time, I've learned that I've had to shit on myself in a healthy way, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, in a mm -hmm, healthy mm -hmm. way, because I know how to shit on myself in a, a fucking very toxic way as well. Yeah. Um, but when you, I turned it around, I mean, learning from you, um, watching a lot of stand up, and um, honestly, so thankful that you bring me on here. Um, I just uh, talked with an old friend from a long time. Like he's been my friend since like second grade back in Seattle. Um, telling me that he watches, uh, you know, every episode here, you know? And when I come on, like he, he tells me how like awesome it is that I can tell stories that over time I've been able to just be real, keep it real and be my true self. And the, going back to the whole social media shit, what I see a lot is people putting up a representation of themselves. Yeah. The best version of themselves. Which is not even the best version of themselves because it's not even them. It's not you. Yeah. It's not you. It's the best version of a person that you want people to believe is you. And it's yeah. not you. Yeah. And guess what? That shit eats people up inside. And, and what really helped me was when I had to go back to Washington and work at the store, like was, um, you know, our, our friend Dan was just telling us, telling me like, look, you know, racist shit is going to happen. You know, bad things are going to happen. But he's like, you're a creator, you're a content creator, man, just use it. And then he told me, shoot yourself in the foot before they can shoot you in the heart. 
Yeah. And that stuck with me forever, you know? So when all that terrible shit happened at my store, that's why I constantly kept posting it. Yeah. Because that's really what's happening. Although it, it, it fucking hurt and um, there's a lot of shit that came with it. The way that I could deal with it and cope with it was to post these crazy fucking videos yeah. of all the shit that was happening to entertain people. And that opened a door for people to come in and like, cause when, when I post that shit, I don't want people to get angry, yeah. you know, cause of the racist shit, but then I want people to laugh and be by my side and know that then I know that they have my back. But that's the greatest thing about comedy though, right? And I think a lot of people are forgetting that. The reason why you don't think a lot of comics are funny is because you won't allow them to poke at these very topics that shouldn't be touched. Right. That is what comedy is about. Trying to find the fucking funny in things that aren't fucking funny. When it hurts. Yeah. When it fucking hurts and there's pain, like what people fail to recognize is the Shakespearean, um, the drama masks, right? There's those two masks, the faces, one that's crying and one that's laughing, right? The idea of those two masks is that they're feeling the same thing, pain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are you gonna do with your pain? I felt so much pain for so many years, right? And you, you know me, I had anger issues as well. Um, and the way I could deal with it best and cope with it and mm -hmm. live and continue on was to laugh, mm -hmm. was to keep laughing, right? Um, I mean, I, I, I uh, had my spot on JK News and I talked about some real shit, mm -hmm. but ultimately what I found from it when, when some bad shit happened was that after it happened and I can process it, I can sit there and fucking laugh at how hilarious the situation is when you step out and look, right? And there's a really, like this, this fucking like sweet spot, you know, in whether it's content, comedy or whatever, where there's sadness and laughter yeah, at the same time where it's both. And that's why also I appreciated uh, Inside Out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. they really got that idea through that it's both, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's joy and pain, it's both, right? And when you can recognize that you can cope much better you, you won't fall into a spiral as hard. Like, I mean, you, I'm not saying it's not, you're not going to, but you can deal with it. You can step over it. You can live another day, right? Yeah. And like when you face it though, like you did, like going up on that stage, facing your fears, because for real though, like honestly, all those motherfuckers that talk shit to you and whatever, they still didn't do what you did. They no, still didn't face their fears That's like the thing did. too. It's like the hard part for me too is, you know, we, we always go through that idea of, you know, the concept of imposter syndrome mm. every fucking day. I could work on this craft 24 fucking seven and know that I'm somewhat decent at it, maybe even good, mm -hmm. but I still won't believe it because I feel like I don't deserve it. Yeah. Right. And I've, I've done this before. I've literally married people on the spot. <laughs> They're like, Hey, do you want to be the fucking yeah. priest at their wedding? Like what? <laughs> and I did a fucking 20 minute speech about their relationship and life and what they should look forward to, you know, on the spot. I remember Mariel got to see me on a mic for the first time and it was at that wedding. Right. And then she looks at me, she goes, how'd you do that? I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. To be honest with you, I don't fucking know. Yeah. I goes, I don't know. She goes, you didn't prep. And you literally had no idea that you were going to marry these people. And you fucking pulled out this crazy speech. I wish they recorded it because I want to know what I said. <laughs> And she goes, how'd you do that? I was like, I don't know. But that's just me for me doing standup since I was 16. Right. Like being in these weird situations, even at the fucking wedding where you bombed, <laughs> I had to go take over because the DJ was coked the fuck out. Yeah. Oh my God. Like as bad as I was, that DJ pissed me the fuck off. But he, anywho, yeah. He was like on a come down from like the coke that he did the night before. <laughs> he was like, just, first of all, this fat fuck, I'm talking about legit obese. And he was sweating his ass off. Sweating. And I first thought it was because he was fat. It was because this guy was coming down from a high. He was coked the fuck out. Bloodshot eyes, fucking bags under his eyes. Didn't know where the fuck he was at. Maybe he was going through alcohol withdrawals. I don't know what it was. I honestly asked him, I was like, yo, where'd you get this guy? And he said, we just went to Craigslist, yeah. got whatever. I'm like, why? The worst. <laughs> <laughs> and the bride is fucking tearing up. I was like, give me the fucking mic. I'll, 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 I'll fucking, you know, be the MC. Yeah, the MC. And I just MC the rest of the night. 
And that's just from years and years of bombing on stand up yeah. and just trying to be comfortable on the mic and trying to command that stage. That's true. I mean, a lot, if I, if I look back to, um, about my behaviors in the past, like I, I said a lot of things out loud and I don't know what it is, but then I just say shit without thinking it through. Hey. And you realize in life, you, you spend a lot of your time in your teens and whatever, you're, you're, you're the class clown or whatever. You're, you're trying out all these jokes. You think someone's going to laugh and they don't, right? But then you just keep trying. You keep trying with your friends too. Um, and that was one of the stepping stones for me to be comfortable in like doing public speech or um, comfortable being on camera here with you on this podcast. Like it took some time. Like you could see the very first podcast I was on. I was sweating balls. <laughs> hey, me yeah. too. If you go back to the very first podcast I did, I didn't know what I was saying. Yeah. It was so difficult to just kind of think of, of content on the spot, but everything takes practice and time. Mm -hmm. This is a skill. And I just think back to like the times I was in a Taco Bell parking lot or, you know, a church parking lot with my friends. And then you just shoot the shit mm -hmm. and then you are comfortable in your own skin and allowing yourself to be you. Right. I think a lot of people have a tough time looking at themselves in the mirror and really looking at themselves in their soul, and loving themselves yeah. and, and we, accepting themselves. We were talking about, you know, uh, people who don't like to go to therapy sometimes. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the issues that I know that a lot of people face with that is the idea that they now have to confront the things that they already know are bad things about themselves. Yeah. And they have to fix it now. Yeah. Because deflecting is so fucking easy. It's the first thing to do. You get defensive. You you look at everybody else as if they're the problem. But you know, in your hearts of heart, you you have something wrong with you. Yeah. And now if you go to therapy and there's an objective person that's outside of this bubble that has that tells you, listen, these are the issues that you might be facing, they can't run away from it now. Yeah. Now they either have to cry about it, they have to be, they have to confront these emotions. And now that it's out there in the ether, it's right in front of their face, they have to address it. Mm -hmm. You can't just be like, oh, I'm just gonna go out and go drink with my friends. No, it's guess what? We said it now. You know the issue. You've acknowledged it. So what are you going to do about it? So either you address it and become a better person or you are that piece of shit that you that everybody says that you are. Yeah, yeah. It is the craziest fucking mental gymnastics that people will do. Not even just therapy. Just somebody else who confronts them about their problems. They will do mental gymnastics just to not confront these issues and either accept it or become better from it. Right. And it's hard. I know it is so fucking hard. Like everyone can accept the fact that we're not perfect. Yeah. But when it comes to, okay, then let's be better. Uh -uh. Yeah. I don't understand that part. But to be honest, like, like I said, we always bring it back. Like we're church boys. Yeah. The idea of sanctity, right? Um, the pursuit of holiness that I'm not perfect, but one day, one day I will be right. But to think that way that one day I will be would means that you need to do the work now that you have to get over yourself. You have to get over your pride and your ego. You have to get over um, like being humiliated mm -hmm. and change the perspective. Not that you're, you are humiliated, you know, but that um, you are humanized, Yeah, you know, <laughs> that um, you're not where you want to be, but you will be someday. And you just have to work through it. I think one of the biggest things for me too is accepting um, the things that are shameful, quote unquote, but not being ashamed of myself. Yeah. Right. And accepting myself and being who I am to mm -hmm. allow myself to talk about the worst parts of myself. The last fucking podcast is talking about my drug addiction. Yeah, and shit, yeah, you know? yeah. But um, I, I look through and, you know, this is something I don't really talk about, but most of my friends I grew up with, like my tight knit friends, they, they fell under really hard drugs. Yeah. Which is a really weird thing about, you know, Tacoma up there within my friend group, it was, it was tough to face that all of us had these drug issues. But for me and coming out of it was being able to talk about it and not be ashamed of it and not be ashamed of my fuck ups. To look at the shit I did when I was drunk, you know, <laughs> and talk about, yeah, I fucked up bad that time, you mm -hmm. know, like that best man speech. <laughs> but when, when I talk about it and then I accept it, it's like, I'm way over it. I'm way above it. Do you still have it. the best band speech in your phone? Hell no. I wish you would have kept it. Hell 
Hell no. I'm glad that you nobody can find it, please. But I'm just saying, dude, if you would have kept it and you recited it back on this podcast, it would have been the best therapy ever. Like, oh you, my God. Hey, I, would, I would shrimp up into a ball. <laughs> I cry myself. Bro, I, call, I, I, I remember I grabbed the mic. I was like, well, Ed is done with the speech titled I'm born with a curse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had a point. I was trying to say something, but it just didn't come out. I mean, you out. drank way too much. You got smashed. Oh my God. For the God. nerves. Yeah. But it was just too much alcohol. Yeah, man. I mean, and, and at, that, at that time, me being a big guy, like I didn't have a limit. Yeah. I mean, um, Paul... Paul Kim had to tell me what happened by the time I had completely, I mean, I was already like blacked out somewhere, but he told me that um, there, there was like a karaoke there, there was photo booths and shit. But then what they really had was like bottles and bottles, bottles of Jameson and all this alcohol. And he said, I, I poured two giant cups just to the brim uh, of Jameson and I gave it to Paul. I was like, cheers, man. And then Paul said that I, fucking chug that entire cup right and he said yo i can't drink this and he said meth i said fuck you man like don't be a bitch and i took it and i drank his and then i literally just timber get fell. the fuck out I of felt here like um kevin park he was there apparently i fell on him i grabbed him and we both fell on the gravel oh and i was out my God. And then these dudes had to carry me and put me in the car for me to just pass out. And then Matt Pecker. So next thing I know, next thing I know, I wake up and Matt Pecker's in my apartment sleeping next to me. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing here? We didn't do anything right. It's like, hey, hey, am I gay? Am I gay now? He said, no, I drove you home, but it's like, I guess he didn't have anywhere to sleep. So he just stayed at my place. That's hella funny, dude. But I mean, look at me. I'm talking about it. Yeah. I mean, that was a long time ago. When we were, the deepest, saddest part yeah. of me. No, nah, like uh, I'm going to be open and talk about it because I'm not that person anymore. I don't Way even remember that. what I did that night after that because I got pretty drunk too. So I couldn't remember too much. Yeah. <laughs> so like, I don't, I just remember looking at you from a distance and I was just like, you are four seconds away from collapsing because yep. you kept swaying. <laughs> <laughs> you look like a palm tree in a storm, dude. You just <laughs> Just somebody, please, just make sure he doesn't fall. There's there's a video of me trying to break dance. <laughs> I try to do the windmill. <laughs> and then I just pop, just plop and fucking fall Dude, out on I the floor. I said this will a fucking video of this fool in, in, in the studio doing a body roll just drunk out of his mind on the floor and I'm saying, loosen up my buttons, baby. Oh, no. And this one is just fucking hands behind his head, belly out, oh, fucking doing the belly God. wave. I was like, I have no recollection of this, man. I didn't even recollect it. It was just in my computer. Oh, Because I'm pretty sure I was drunk too. So, right. so you, you were just doing this. Bro, that fucking video had me dying, man. I mean, I guess the whole thing of it, I was just like, you have to, you just have to accept yourself. Yeah. Flaws and all. But, and in the worst part of yourself, like you have to love yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's where you also have to find the hater part of yourself. I guess when you're projecting, because when I look back to, I don't think I would hate on somebody who was in that position too. Cause I know I'm that way. Yeah. 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 Right. And, and that's when I, I do have to check myself too. Am I being a hater or um, am I poking fun because I've been there? Yeah, right? I think we're just poking fun because we've been there, you yeah. know? And also too, go back, going back to the idea of like, am I being a hater? You know, when I talk about new media, you guys understand I'm, I'm in media too. Yeah, you've been there. I'm not hating on it. I'm just trying to give you a better perception of it so you're better prepared when you dive into this thing. Right. When I say like, listen, not everybody here is a millionaire. They go hater. Or maybe I'm giving you some good advice. Yeah. Like prepare yourself for this. Prepare to work. Get a Pre second job. <laughs> yeah. You're going to have to work a job and do this at the same time. And if you get lucky, maybe you won't have to do it anymore. There's mm. a reason why a lot of influencers don't make a lot of money, right? They make a few bucks here and there and it's supplemental and they get to save up while they work their regular job. That's why I feel like the ones who know and understand it best, um, this new social media age, are the ones who work acting and stand up. Yeah. Because then they know they got to be a waiter on the side. Yeah. How right? many actors do you know that are on TV? They're still working another job. Yep. 
Like, yeah, yep. you saw them on CSI. You saw them here and there. Guess what? They're, they're still <laughs> waiting tables at yeah. Bossa Nova. Rope. <laughs> there's no, and there's nothing fucking wrong with that. Yep. And they're they're doing what they have to do to, to make it happen. But there's a realistic expectation. And I'm trying to help this next generation. And I'm really supporting them. Like, yo, I, the kids will message me and I'll see uh, some people will message me. I'll look at their content. I'm like, yo, this shit's tight. But they're like, okay, well, how do I make money on this? It's like, I'm, I can't explain this on an Instagram thing. But just to know, don't let go of your job. Keep doing this and then mm -hmm. build a business. Yeah. And then it's got to be a bonus. Yeah. Right. Because you're having, you're supposed to have fun doing it too. Yeah. Right. There's no way I would have been able to stay in this platform if I wasn't having fun. Right. And it's, then this is the funnest shit I do. On the yeah. week, you <laughs> this know? is the funnest like, shit I do, man. This is cheaper than therapy. Bro, I've had this crazy idea. And you know what? The person who, the person who really helped me compartmentalize this better was actually Casey Neistat. Okay. I used to love Casey Neistat stuff only because. I saw this video where he was talking about how much he works, not on his other projects, but on his YouTube videos. And this guy's a gajillionaire <laughs> and he makes his, he does his own videos. Yeah. And the reason why is because he loves what he does. Mm. He has done, sold a show to HBO. He's done a lot of things. He's been in, you know, he wasn't an actor, but he was in a film. I forgot what film he was in, but he has these opportunities yeah. and he always goes back to YouTube. And he said that the reason why he loved YouTube is because, because this is my space. Yeah. I get to create how I want. He has no FOMO in other people who are on TV, who are doing these other things. And he goes, why would I turn my back on the thing that makes me the happiest? Yeah. And I had it all fucked up in my head. I thought to myself, oh my God, my, you know, other people expect me to be an actor. They say, I'm a good actor. I can do all these. I can be in these films. And I never asked myself, do I want it? Mm. I was like, maybe I just like being on YouTube. Yeah. And what's the problem in that? And you like creating. I like creating. Yeah. What is the problem? And it doesn't matter what medium it is. Jumbi is a part of creating. I want our, our brand to be the biggest matcha brand in the United States. Yeah. And then somebody's going to look at me and say, well, you weren't in a movie. <laughs> <laughs> But but you were, but <laughs> yeah, 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 I was. So it's like I, there's not even that. Yeah. So it's like, cool. Yeah, and they they'll look at your your other businesses as if you're a failure. Yeah, at acting, like, dog, what the fuck? That's how you see it. Like, you know, I I've run into my uh, you know friends who are actors and waiters, and then I didn't know they were working at a, a restaurant. Mm -hmm. You think I'm there like, oh, you must be having a tough time. No. No, I'm like, yo, no, can you hook it up? Yeah. <laughs> I'm hungry. Dude, yeah, for real. He's grinding, man. <laughs> yeah. Like you got to give it up to them. You have to be proud for them too. Then you would be able to proud of, be able to be proud of yourself for what you do. If you are working two jobs, if you're doing two things, if one's not enough, but it's still your passion. You know, that's why I, I've never been ashamed of talking about working at a gas station and putting it out there. The, the, like this shame culture based on like what people do is so fucking dumb. People have to work these jobs in these positions. Like we need them. Yeah. So when you, when you're like, even like, I, I'll never understand this. Like when um, somebody will talk to me and they, they know who I am. Right. They go, oh, I'm like, oh, so what do you do? Right. They go, yeah, I'm, I'm a waiter and shit. I'm not doing what you do. I was like, why, why even do this? Like this conversation sucks, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Why can't it be like, oh, I'm waiting. I like I wait at this restaurant. I don't understand this hierarchy. Yeah. Right. Especially for me as a creative, you do understand that I just, I just, a part of it's luck and a lot of it's hard work. Yeah. Right. But there's nothing in my mind that goes, shit, I'm a creator. You're a waiter. Yeah. Yeah. Like why, why would you put somebody down over that shit? How is my job any better than yours? Right. And, and I'll be it too. You might even just be making the same money as I do. Who the fuck knows? Yeah. I know waiters who make a shit ton of money, to be honest with you. So it's like, I don't understand. Like there should be no shame in working a job. Like if I, I've had to deal with people, for example, who have college degrees and they'd rather scrape by, borrow money from other people than work a job because they have a degree and working a blue collar job is beneath them. Right. Oh my, I've meet, I meet so many people. That what know. is that and shit? They don't even have a degree. But then like someone literally crying, like by my side, like, I don't want to work a bullshit job. I'm like, what the fuck? You're not better than Burger King. Yeah. They're worth like billions of dollars. They can pay you. Yeah. You know, all you got to do is just do what they ask. Like, what are you better than them? Like, I know I joke about this and I won't be in this situation now because I've set myself up, but I have no problem. Like mm. if this whole shit exploded, all my Jumbi stuff exploded or whatever, guess what? You might see me in an Uber. <laughs> I'll be in that Uber. Yeah. I'll be working that part-time job here and there. I, I, I'll do what I have to do. Yeah. You know?
And, and like, you can't be ashamed of yourself. We'll keep saying that over and over again. You can't be ashamed of yourself. I'll be more ashamed if I have to go ahead and choose to borrow money from somebody and then rather work myself and make that money myself. Mm -hmm. You and I have a friend, um, very successful, OG YouTuber. Uh, I, I met up with him to catch up too. He told me he was doing like, uh, what's the grocery delivery? App? Oh, um, DoorDash. DoorDash. He was doing that. I'm, and he's just far as I know, OG, like successful, all that shit. And he said, you know, at one point I had to do that. And he didn't even have shame in his voice as he said it. And it made me very proud of him. And it allowed me to accept that, yeah, I got to work second jobs too. Yeah. You know, it, it's just a part of life. You don't have to put yourself down for doing it. I wonder right? how much door, I'd do DoorDash right now if I want. <laughs> <laughs> if I, like, if man, I have too much time on my hands. Yeah. <laughs> if I have a lot of time, it's fucking, maybe I will do DoorDash. Yeah. I kind of want to know what it's like. I want to know like how much money you can make on DoorDash. And then, but I'm not with my forerunner. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I'll make absolutely fucking yeah, nothing, dude. Put all that money back dude, into I gas. Put, I put $40 in my tank yesterday and then I had to fill up again this morning. <laughs> yeah, man. That shit like, is killer. What is this? It's fucking killer, trash. Man. Well, guys, that wraps up this episode of the Genius Brain Podcast. We were supposed to do two movies. Yeah, we're going to do the next one. <laughs> This like, happens a lot, but yeah. you know what? We have some real conversations yeah. and I'm, I think that's cool too, <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, uh, you can find Ed at Ed Park VP. Um, catch him on all his fucking socials. Hit him up and Genius Brain every Sundays at 12 p.m. And by the way, just to give you guys a heads up, Secret Society and Genius Brain will be doing our first collab together. Mm. It is one of my, I, I fucking love this collab so much. It's going to be pre-orders for the shirt, so we're not going to make this ahead of time. Mm. just because it's expensive the other way around but it's uh you guys pre-order it we'll get it out to you as fast as possible uh uh getting the samples next week so i don't know when this po podcast is going to drop but hopefully you'll have it out by then and it's fucking sick it's actually inspired from my trip to korea nice so it's a lot about the culture stuff that we talk about here and kind of going through the idea of when i was a kid of not being I want to say not being proud of where I came from, but I didn't realize how important it was to me. Mm. And when you go back to Korea and you see it, and I, I kind of designed this shirt that's just as much as this podcast, as much as my pride as a secret society in that trip to Korea. So cop it. It's, it's fucking sick. Like this shirt is going to be dope. Uh, yep. Genius Brain every Sunday is at 12 p.m. We'll see you next time. Peace. Peace.